morning again. <coughs> Let me turn on my devices here so we can get all hooked up and ready to go. You know, I went to a class uh, uh, for the VA. They trained me how to do things. And at the end, they give these funny joke awards. And one of the things was uh, I got an award. It says uh, Starry's Desk for the Black Hole. It says uh, everything goes in and nothing comes out. And there's, there's more devices than I've ever seen any one person have. I, I do have a lot of, I do like technology. Sometimes it gets too much sometimes, I guess. Uh, I like my gadgets, and sometimes uh, I like them too much. <laughs> So they would make fun of me, you know. How many, how many phones and how many iPads and how many computers you can have on one desk? Well, I don't know. How many, how many things can I get distracted with, right? You know. So we live in a world of distraction today, right? <coughs> Today's uh, sermon I was I titled uh, "Definitions That Define Us." I have two key verses today. So if you uh, open your Bible to Malachi three six, and some of you can open your Bible maybe with another thumb in Romans nine twenty. <coughs> I think. Uh, we have a lot of distractions, but we also have something else going on today, um, a lack of sound definition, a lack of sound understanding. Uh, we are leaving uh, what is wise and understandable as quickly as possible. Our uh, culture is wholeheartedly selling out for whatever feels good, whatever uh, is impassioned, whatever is emotional, becomes our standard, our new definition. So this morning I'd like to read for you two, quote, uh, two verses real quick to start off the morning. Uh, for I am the Lord, and I change not, in Malachi 3, 6. You see, God is uh, the author, right? But he's also uh, the God, the Bible defines as the God who never changes, Sometimes we think of that as a bad thing, but uh, he defines it as uh, a good thing, not only a good thing, but as the creator of this universe, consider the fact that uh, we have laws that are in place in this universe that keep us alive, that keep things working and keep things moving. If he decides to change on a whim like we do today with society and definitions, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But because he doesn't change, because he has set things in place that are absolute, they don't change. And we're able to live because of that. So we look at another verse, Romans 9, 20. We go in response. Uh, he says, O man, who are thou that contradicts God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me this way? <clears throat> if you think about it, the God of the universe, who is so vast in knowledge, power, and understanding beyond us made everything. We understand maybe the entire world together, all humanity together combined, maybe <laughs> an ounce of nothing comparatively. And who are we to say to him, oh, why did you do it this way? And we presume how many people get out there, well, if I were God, obviously God is not in charge because we have all these problems and obviously God is too foolish or ignorant or he's not good enough, right? And yet, most of these accusations come from the heart of bitterness because we choose to do those things we accuse him of. Isn't it funny, contradictions-wise, definitions-wise, the definitions of many of the things we accuse God are, the very definition that we have fulfilled? God, why did you do this and kill this person? Well, wait, wait, wait. Somebody went and stabbed him. I mean, that was a, a decision by a human being, not God. You see, we take definitions. We love to twist them. That's today's generation. We are in a definition Changing, altering reality. Give me a moment to get these out of my way. <coughs> Very few people take responsibility for those things. So, looking at those verses, let's go to the Lord in prayer and consider these thoughts. Dear Heavenly Lord, uh, I come to you this morning and I ask that you would be in with us here and that you would humble our hearts, not only um, to look at the, the definitions that we are living by and the definitions that we are communicating through, but that you would define in us that right spirit, that you would help us to see the truth, that we would analyze ourselves in the mirror, that we would ask you and seek your face honestly, not for show and not for 
what's in this congregation or where we are at at church or who we're talking to as a brother, but as ourselves personally, looking in the mirror honestly and saying, Lord, who am I before you? And what standards do I live by? Do I live by the standard that changes every minute with my emotion? Or do I live by an absolute standard that helps me get up every morning and remember the value of the people around me? That helps me remember not only who I am, but what you have done for me and what you've done in this universe, in this world, and how much you have loved us and desired to show us the truth, regardless of our <coughs> petty emotions and our rebelliousness. Jesus, I ask these things in your name. So, <coughs> definitions that define us. Today we live in a world that does not adhere to clear definitions, and it rejects personal accountability. We know that clearly. We see that in the media world today, right? Uh, you have YouTube and you have Facebook and you have all this social media. I would have to say that uh, since the rise of all the social media, we have become more polarized, more segregated, and more ignorant in general since the social media has given us all of this information to overwhelm us. It's not ignorance out of lack of information. It's ignorance out of intentional self-indoctrination. Consider this. Google has their search engine, one of the, one of the most powerful search engines on, on the planet Earth right now, right? They filter for you all the things that you have shown that you like, whether it's through your phone or whatever app, wherever you log in. They're going to filter everything you want to hear. Isn't that a kind of a mixed up definition of life? You know, uh, before social media, you had to actually talk to somebody and find out their difference of opinion. Now you only find your opinion filtered just for you. I mean, think about it. We have become hypersensitive, hyperpolarized, hyper personal moralized because we allow social media, even as ourselves, even as Christians, to dictate and to govern our decisions. We say, ah, never trust the media, right? And everybody says that. I mean, I see these things saying, you know, nobody trusts the media, yet everybody still loves their media source. What definitions are we following? Are they governed by men? Or are they governed by the absolute law of God? Are they governed by the word of God that has never changed and that never will change and that has never lost its applicability to every generation? Or are we going to go with every whim that changes on emotion? So, defined, you know, Oxford Dictionaries chooses a word every year. And in 2016, I love the fact that they chose a new word to define the era, right, or to define that year. They used, they used the word post-truth. Post-truth. You see it, it defines in the dictionary as an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Editors said the use of the term post-truth has increased around 2,000% in 2016 compared to the prior year. I think it's kind of funny. I mean, even the world points out yeah, we're not really worried about truth or facts. We're worried about emotion, somebody's opinion, and their personal relative morality, as opposed to what is objective fact. That's a scary thought, that even the, the modern society of dictionary people says, hey, this is what the world chooses, post-truth. Uh, or untruth, some of them use a, another term that's quite used, untruth, you know, rather have emotion than what's fact. So <clears throat> I want to bring us through four definitions today, four sets of definitions as it were. The first one we'll look at are ones we choose to have that we choose to have to work for and to earn. Ones that, the uh, second one will be ones that we choose, uh, or actually ones that are chosen for us or given to us by someone else. These definitions are given to us. Uh, <coughs> ones, uh, the third one is ones that we choose but are very easy and are done like that. One little thing makes that de definition true and it sticks with us, right, forever. If 
finally, I want to look at the ones that are immutable, or as, as, uh, as the definition says, unchangeable, unchanging. They do not change, right? And they are uh, outside and beyond those first three. But they affect those first three. And they can affect those first three. Or they can be ignored. <coughs> Each of these three definitions, the first three, relate to us in the mortal flesh. They relate to us in the reality that we deal in every day. And they can change or stay the same depending on what the culture allows. For quite a long time in America, our definition stayed very much the same for many years from the foundation of America. But in the last generation, uh, many things have changed. The fourth set of definitions are applicable outside and beyond the reach of humanity. We try to. We, we talk and we have our own relative terms to us, right? We, we say, oh, God is good, and we have this, and we, we, we define things in what, we, what I call Christianese, right? We talk Christianese, you know, the average guy's going to go, I'm not sure what he's saying. He sounds like one of those religious fanatics, right? He's got his Christianese talk, you know, oh, amen, praise God, he's good. You know, what does that mean, those things? You know, we have all these things. He's righteous. He's those things, right? So we have these things, and we forget the definitions, or we forget the meanings to the definitions. We forget to share that meaning. And sometimes we're just talking to impress people, right? So the fourth definition set that I'm talking about is more of a spiritual set, the one that God defines, right? <coughs> and these change uh, the nature of reality for us. They, they focus us on truth that's absolute. And they are given by an absolute giver, right? And these truths are stable and the stabilizers of the first three sets of definitions. Because as anything, we know what? Language changes over time, so do definitions change over time. But the reality is those definitions don't change arbitrarily without consequence, right? It is, is it not the parent's duty to enforce order and to define the world to their children? Right, we do that in our children, we teach them this, and this is what this means, and this is why it is, right? This is why it's good. So <clears throat> is this not what teachers do or even civilized societies? We profess to have these things. We define things. We give law and order, right? We give limits, right? Yet <clears throat> we all like to stretch the definition to allow for pleasures we are denied. Think about it. <clears throat> we all do this in many forms. We justify this or that. We procrastinate when something requires more than we want to give, right? Or more than we feel like giving. <clears throat> we justify this or that thing constantly, right? We devalue things that require personal sacrifice, or inversely, we inflate what others fail to do for us or to us or against us, right? Oh, he did all this. Nine times out of ten, when we accuse somebody else, we're pretty much guilty of hypocrisy, aren't we? 90% of the time, he lied to me. When did I just lie to my boss last week? I kind of stretched that truth so he didn't know this. You know, we all do it, right? And sometimes the definitions change even for us as Christians. We, we have it all the time because of our sin nature. We define ourselves how we want to be seen, not how the facts are. Definitions are important, right? So as Christians, the Bible says we're to be quite a few things. And one of the things we should be seen as being stable not like the world changing every five minutes, changing based on our emotions. That's what the world expects. I mean, when, they, when you look at mo movies or videos today, right, um, how much would you say the average video, or well, let's, let, let's, let's give it this way, would you say that the Christians that are in any video today in Hollywood are ever given in any good or decent or even intelligible light? I mean, would you? I don't think I've seen much any videos out there that doesn't make the either the Christian guy either this, this sycophant, pervert, uh, deviant liar, or just an absolute moron, right? I mean, 90% of the time, almost everyone, when they go, oh, he's the Christian guy, or especially if he's a preacher, he's usually a sycophant, or he's usually some weirdo, right? Almost every movie, almost every TV show, right? I mean, do you live life like any of those people in any of those Christian, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of the, uh, let's come to church and pretend to be happy. Uh, you know, I'm not grumpy. I'm a smiley guy. I love to be happy. But I'm rarely, I rarely have the energy to pretend to smile like everything's good. That's reality. I mean, we live in it or we don't. How we define reality is not based on somebody else's opinion. It's based on truth. 
And we live it every day at work, right? You come to work, you're mad sometimes. You go to work, you're upset sometimes. You're unhappy. <clears throat> Our definitions shouldn't change based on where we're standing or where we're sitting. <clears throat> Let's go into the first one, the first definition set. Those things that define us, but we have to work to earn, right? Time and skill are necessary for these things. To be a carpenter, let's say, you must train and learn and practice in that field. We say you would apprentice in that to have the eventual privilege of being called a carpenter. In fact, in the military, like uh, we have engine mechanics per se, uh, you must learn the functions and the principles involved in that field and work to earn the title of mechanic, right? I mean, any of your professions, right? You have these things called training records. You work toward earning that thing, right? And once you've earned it, in, in fact, in the military, we used to have the, the five-level badge. You weren't considered it until you had your badge. So it's kind of lessened a bit over the years, but the same right still goes. The guy that walks in the door, he's not an engine mechanic because he got there the first year, right? I mean, he's not a, uh, what any of your professions are. In that first year, first two years, most of you wouldn't consider those new guys that job title, would you? They're earning it, right? They're proving themselves to earn it, right? They have to work toward it. They don't just get it just because they walked in and said, I signed up on the line, that's what the job I'm doing. Because nine times out of 10, if they can't pass the test or they can't do the work, what, what you know, cross train out of the Air Force or out of the service, whatever service you had, right? Or cross trained in the Army, right? Anyway, it's a joke, sorry. <coughs> There's not too many Army here. I just poke, I just poke at my Army, but my Army buds, they always poke at me, so I gotta poke back. <coughs> How about this, the NCO, he must study and pass tests to be awarded the rank. We can all have our jokes about whether or not someone earned something, but at the end of the day, they have to work to earn that, even if it's shallow in somebody else's opinion. They have to work to earn it. How about this, an officer? He has to work to achieve other titles and definitions first so that he can then apply it to get a new title called an officer, right? So those are titles, those are definitions given to us that have to be worked towards, right? They take a little time. But then there's the third, uh, second definition set, and these are given by others. I think we'll all get a, a few chuckles out of this. When a baby is born, what race is he? The human race, right? When a dog is born, he's born a dog, right? So those definitions are given with no choice of that person or that thing, right? You know, that dog is born, he's a dog. That human being is born, be he ugly or beautiful, he's born human, right? Doesn't matter what you want to call him. I got my brothers, uh, they poked on me. They're 10 years older than me, right? They tormented me for ever that I can remember. So when their first sons were born, I made sure to tell them, that is the ugliest kid I've ever seen in my life. I was the only way I could stab them back. They were, you know, they would beat me up when I was a kid. So I was like, I've waited 20 years to tell you your kid is ugly. <sighs> right? You know, get your brothers back, right? So I gave them their definition, ugly baby, ugly human baby, right? So uh, to be given, uh, how about this? A gift can define the, give, uh, the receiver. One is either the receiver or the um, recipient, or how about this? We tend to give gifts to those we care about, right? They could be a friend. By that, by that gift, we define them as a friend, or we define them as a, a loved one, right? So they get a new definition given to them, right? They don't get the choice. When you give a gift, it's not by their work, it's by yours, someone else's, right? How about this, we all love this one. <coughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Your kid gets sick, shares it with his next kid, he shares it with his family, the family shares it at school, the school shares it with the next kid, and the next kid shares it with your family, and that family shares it at church, and that church family shares it with the 50 other church families. And it just keeps going around. It's the gift that keeps uh, sharing, right? We keep giving that definition. You're sick. Ah, thanks for that definition, right? Thanks for defining that, right? So we give it. No choice in that one, unfortunately. <coughs> no matter how sterilized and stay away from people, what are you going to do, you know? If you like a quote says, more people I meet, the more I love my dog. I mean, you... You're going to stay away from people for your life? Even then, you're still going to get things given to you that you're not going to want, right? So the third definition set are those things that we <coughs> do only one time, and it'll change everything for us instantly. How about this? If you steal something, regardless of frequency, value, or size, <coughs> what does it make you? By definition, we call it a thief, right? If you lie someone once, doesn't matter how many times, how big the lie is, who you lied to, how often you lied, if you lie to me, you're a liar, right? That's how we all think, right? How dare he lie to me? I mean, I'll lie to my boss tomorrow, you know, to 
kind of stretch the truth. It won't be really a lie. I'll just kind of, I'll let him only know certain things, you know? So we all do it, right? I mean, so those are two kind of we defend, right? And then this third one, how about this? How often uh, do you think you have to commit murder to be called a murderer? One time, right? And almost everyone's going to answer that, right? One time. He's a murderer, right? And you know why that funny thing is? You see, the first two people, uh, or the first two groups, uh, commonly stretch the definition to fit their own moral perspective, right? Or their own circumstances. Because we all kind of know we've all, we've all kind of lied, or we've all kind of stolen something at some point in time, taking things in our arms, right? So we, we kind of stretch it, right? We, st- we take those things, we change it. Uh, so we change the definition kind of stealing is based on what? Frequency or value becomes all of a sudden. I'm not a thief. I haven't stolen anything big. Or, you know, I didn't steal anything last week or I didn't steal anything for the last five years, right? So, or if I lied, I, it wasn't a big one. It was a little white lie. It's not that important, right? But we instantly go, oh, murderer. I'm guiltless of that one. So I can, I can hammer on that person, right? But we, we fail to realize that uh, the source of that definition uh, is God when he says he finds the source of it in the heart of men and that from the seat of hatred, right? Which everyone is guilty of. <coughs> so that's why we, why, why, are the two most, why are the two most offensive things to talk about anywhere is religion and politics? <coughs> religion, you know, that, that's just, the Bible says, doing good works to the, the needy and the poor and the, the widow. It's offensive because it talks about the same exact thing, whether it be politics or religion, your moral foundation. Someone else is judging whether or not your morals are good or as good or better than theirs. Right? That's why we're offended, ultimately. Why would you choose that politician? Are you saying, I have a bad choice because I have a less moral stance than you? You're wicked. Right? <coughs> so, we have our self-defenses, even us as Christians. We're not, we're not guiltless of this. We're, we're not free from it, unfortunately, because we live in a body of sin. You see, we live in a world where definitions are always being changed, and change is are often uh, done rapidly as each culture allows. In other words, depending on the absolute values set over them, they'll change or they won't. If absolute values are removed, they degrade instantly. They degrade very rapidly. And we're going to go see through some of that. But there's a major problem with every, uh, with, with the very uh, ever-changing definitions aside from the obvious lack of ability to communicate intelligibly, right? You know, you start talking to your kid and they'd be like, yo, gee whiz, ah, da, you know, I got this, you know, was a bang, you know, you're like, I, I don't know what you just said. Uh, you know, I mean, you're living the same generation I do. I don't even know what you just said. You know, you, you got all these, I mean, who, who's got, raise your hand with kids? Who's got kids, uh, teenage kids? How about uh, middle school or, le- or maybe over se- six years old? Okay, how many times they come home and say something, you're just like, you need to define that because I have no idea what you're saying. I mean, does it happen? Right? So we got these new definitions, you know. When I was in uh, high school, I called it Spanglish, you know, where I was at. You know, they'd be like, let's go to El Lanche. And I was like, is that Spanish or English? I'm not sure because I'm pretty sure lunch is English, you know. And they they make everything, you know. And then we got the the non-gangsters, you know, you know. Home dog and G dog and all these weird things. I mean, they got them today, right? You got funny things. You know, I, I make fun of my uh, niece. She sent me GMAS, GMAS on a text. I'm going to GMAS. And I was like, is that like G dog uh, thrown down in a, in, a, in a Catholic mass? I don't know. What, what is that? And she says, Grandma. Oh, okay. Grandma. All right, GMAS is Grandma. Okay, Grandma. So I'm going to Grandma's. Okay. So, you know, we have definitions that change and definitions that evolve and definitions that are just made up on the spot, right? And that's today. Obviously, beside this problem of change is one thing called immutability. Things that never change. Some things will never and cannot change. So there's a contradiction. The things that do change and the things that cannot and will not change. All right? there's, a, there's a challenge here. Malachi 3.6, we go to our key verse. For I uh, am the Lord, I change not. He gives us not only value, but he gives us a standard, right? You see, our God created all things and gave life to all things <coughs> also. He gave us standards and definitions that never change because, obviously, he never changes. He can change how he deals with us based on our repentance or not. 
But that's a standard that still never changes. The Bible says, you hate a man, go deal with the hatred and get rid of it, and then come talk to me. But while he's in his hatred, I, hear, I don't hear your prayers. When he's repentant, okay, I'll listen to you. It's like mom and dad, right? You go tell your sister I'm sorry, or we're done talking. When the child decides to stop throwing a tantrum and goes, okay, and does it, no matter how bad it is, if you give your word, you know, okay. All right, now, now we'll talk. Dinner time, dessert, whatever, whatever the, whatever the thing was, whatever it was, obviously, the standard didn't change. The definition didn't change. Just the response to their decision, the response to that change they decided to make within themselves, right? So we see that. <coughs> The only God, the only true God, who will judge all things, said in Hebrews 4.13, <clears throat> Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's probably one of my, most fa one of my favorite verses, just because it's like power and poetry. It's just an amazing way to say it. You know, some people say the King James was a very poetic language, and uh, just amazing the way they said it. But the power of it is, is like all things are naked and open in the eyes of him of whom we have to do. There is nothing hidden. It's an amazing thought and a scary thought at the same time. It's like the ultimate spy camera. But this spy camera is in the brain. It's in the back of the brain. It's in the source of the thoughts themselves. The Bible says he even sees the imagination of thoughts. It's in our heart. It's in, our, it's in every molecule of our body. He sees every hair on our head. There is not one thing that is missed by God, <coughs> even to the end of our days. And he knows it long before it ever happens, and he still has patience with us. I, mean, I mean, parents, if my parents knew half the things I was going to do, they would have killed me at you know, birth. I'm mean, like, oh, sorry, you know, he's going to kill himself anyway. He's like falling off trees, falling out of buildings, you know, he's jumping out of things. He's going to kill himself anyway. Might as well just end it right now, right? <coughs> or, you know, all the problems I've caused them, the same thing. I'm going to beat that boy to death. You know, I mean, we all, we all know if you have boys, it's usually more aggressive, right? You want to beat them every other day. <clears throat> now, consider the definitions of the following words. <coughs> Excuse me. I meant to say, unlike, his, unlike us, he is not defined by his work, uh, that of creation. Rather, he has defined it by his power and will and by his nature, which only he can define. You see, unlike us, we're defined those three things in the beginning. <coughs> we're given definitions that we have no choice. We're given definitions we choose. And <coughs> at the end of the day, it's actions that define us most of the time, right? God's action of creation does not define him. I, I, it's, it's hard to fathom, it, but he's not defined by it. He says, I'm above and beyond it. I, I cannot be uh, perceived in any, everything and in, in, in by you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not yours to define. <coughs> right? And we're going to see that here. Let's consider some of the definitions that are immutable. Right? Things that he gave us. First, we'll look at his names. A few of his names real quick. Among the many <coughs> of his names, we hear Adonai, Jehovah, Yahweh, Christ Jesus. We, are, uh, we use common names to equate the, uh, the, uh, these names, such as Lord and God in the Bible, because we translate them and we just put capital Lord or lowercase Lord and those things like that. Uh, <coughs> so we, we use those words. He's got names, right? But these names are defined by him, right? Each of these names teach us of a definition of himself, right? <coughs> these definitions don't change. In fact, the name gives us understanding, us, not him. It gives us a vague understanding in reality because we cannot perceive all that God is or, or know him. And the English language or any other language for that matter can't, uh, can't describe to you that, that truth. It just is incapable of describing something that is beyond us. <coughs> so we see uh, language itself the very concept of the definitions is given to us by him if you break it all down. Everything. We as humans begin, uh, we as human beings can try to change what these names mean to us, but God provides, uh, proves this to be an empty labor as we see in Romans 9.20, the, the second verse I had brought to you. 
Nay, O man, uh, nay, but O man, <clears throat> who are you that contradicts God? Shall a thing say to him that formed it, why have you made me this way? Again, he's the definition giver, not the one being defined by his creation. <clears throat> First, we must realize that uh, he is the maker and the definer literally of all things. Even with an eternity and the collective minds of humanity, this is an unfathomable task. To, to perceive this is unreal. Second, he will not bow down to or be controlled by anything in his creation. Third, he is not defined by his creation nor by his works. It is he who defines his works to us. This is truly a paradox. If you think about it, because we live in a world that we define everything by the things that are. But he is not defined by the things that are, because he defined those things for us. He, he gave time, space, and matter to us so that we could understand. He gave words to us so that we could communicate that understanding. It's amazing if you think about it and break it down. <clears throat> Consider the fact that we <coughs> only communicate because he gives us the very definitions of life and breath and individuality in his likeness. That's where it gives value, in his likeness. Because if we were just a, a blurb on a thing or some robot we created, there's nothing, there's nothing of value there that we create. But he created us in his likeness, which gives us an, uh, an attribute like God, a desire to create, a desire to do, a desire to make, a desire to give life, have children, things like that. We have many things because of him. <coughs> As the psalmist wisely said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, that's the understatement of a millennia, and yet it's the, the most clear-cut definition of truth. <coughs> Christian, how about this? He defines this. God calls us to walk after him, to obey him, to work his works, to be holy, to be perfect. <clears throat> God demands it. It's not even a request. It's a demand. It's a command. have to be this to fulfill that name. Oh, why do you think the Bible says when we uh, live after sin, we blaspheme his name? Why? Because we're putting on his name, right? And when we live in sin, when we lie, we steal, we cheat, we literally turn his name into a lie because his name never changes. The value of Christ, when he says, come on to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will take your burden. Take upon my yoke, which is easy, right? Uh, he's t you're, you're taking on his name. And he, and he says, pray in my name. How many times does he say that? Pray in my name. What does that mean? According to his will, he says. He's defined it in a hundred different ways so that there's no wiggle room. Well, I'm going to pray for the next Ferrari. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure that's your lust. And that's your desires, but it's not what God says the reason why he came. The reason, first and foremost, the reason why he came is for men to repent. His desire, first and foremost, he gave up everything, humbled himself, and died on a cross for one reason, one reason only. His desire was us, to redeem us. Our first, our first prayer desire should be the redemption of men. So he defines sin. No matter how people want to define it, unfortunately today, the word sin is the exact synonymous word of humanity, human. Have you ever lied? Yeah, yeah, but I'm human. Have you ever stolen? Yeah, yeah, so is everybody else. They're all human, right? You know, sinners. You know. Go down to the Bible Belt. Yeah, well, we're all sinners, right? Let's go out and drink today. Let's go out and get drunk, have a party, right? You know? uh, let's have a sinner party, right? Let's have a human party. The word has become worthless, but the def definition, the Bible calls it, is missing the mark, and that mark is what? The standard God gave. <clears throat> so we understand the definition uh, that he gave of holiness and righteousness because he made them clear in scripture. It is, it is his character, not anything within creation we look to for the definitions of life because we know it is his very word and power is what holds all things together. As he said in Colossians 1.17, he is before all things and in him all things are held together. He says it again. <coughs> Sorry, losing myself. Again, in Hebrews 1.3, speaking of Christ, who is the image of God and holds all things together by the word of his power. The word of his power. The word which became flesh and dwelt among us. That word, which is Jesus Christ. That power that was from the beginning that created all things literally by his will, still holding it all together. You want to know what holds every atom together? It's the will of God. What holds this world from melting apart, the Bible says, as in the end days? Think about this. They wonder why the atoms hold together because they should go apart. We know what happens in that. It's called a nuclear explosion, right? 
when we think about the last days and he says he's going to melt everything with a fervent heat, it's pretty easy for him. He just stopped holding it together. Instantly everything's gone in heat. That's what we call the heat death, right? The second law of thermodynamics, you know, everything waxes worse and tends towards chaos and turns into heat energy, right? The third law of thermodynamics. Anyway, sorry, lost in my rambling. And God even clarifies his victory over sin in the last part of that verse, and he says, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of God, uh, uh, the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, by that same power, that same power that created us, same power that gave us definition, is the same power that, becomes, that became flesh, who is Christ Jesus, and purged our sins on the cross for his, with his blood. How about this? Science definition. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6.20, Timothy says, Keep that which I have committed to thy trust, according, uh, avoiding wicked and empty speeches and opposing uh, oppositions of science, or we say knowledge today, falsely so called, which some professing such have de deviated from the truth concerning the faith. You see, science literally means knowledge. That's, that's the definition of the word. That's why we use it, right? We use it for what? We use it for what we call the commonly the sciences today, right? Everything that falls under it based on what we do, what? Study, test, repeat, prove. It can't be your opinions. It can't be hypothesis. You can have scientific hypothesis, but it's a stretch of the definition because the definition says knowledge. We don't really know. We're just making a guess. So that's not really knowledge at that point. It's not really science. We have a lot of guesses, but very few uh, things that we compare to are actual science or actual knowledge, right? And here he's talking about a spiritual way, connecting to the faith, right? <coughs> so we see things like that in 2 Peter 3, 3, uh, where he talks about scoffers denying the creation, denying the flood, uh, denying the authority of God, things like that. And, w and w they, he talks about how they define the world in evolutionary terms, that nothing ever changes. Everything waxes the same as it always been. Where's your God? Right? So we see this. We see these definitions because they, they tend to stretch them, right? They tend to change them. Like our parents, when we are young, God teaches us the definitions are there for a good reason. <coughs> Notice what God said to Cain after he made his unacceptable sacrifice to God. Cain gave a bad offering, but I'm going to tell you right now, it wasn't out of ignorance. <clears throat> Read the verses. And the Lord said unto Cain, why are you furious? I mean, does God really need to ask him that question? He knows why he's furious, right? The question is meant for the child, just like your parents, you know. Why, why didn't you clean your room? What kind of answer are you going to give me, right? You know, you already know why he didn't clean his room. You saw him playing a video game. You know, you saw him, uh, you know his attitude. He doesn't care. He hates those things, right? You know, we have a hundred reasons we know why he doesn't clean those things, right? So God knows. And why is thy countenance fallen? Or today we would say, why do you look downcast or depressed, you know? <clears throat> if you do well, shall you not be accepted, question mark? This is a question and a question and a question to get him to, not to answer, to get him to think for himself, Right? We do this as parents all the time, or I'm not a parent, obviously. I have a dog, but the dog doesn't think for himself. But you as parents, you get your children to think for themselves, right? That's the reason of a question. You can use it in a wrong way. You can use it to bash people. Or you can use it, as God gives us, to cause people to think honestly. So, <coughs> if you note, two things of note. The original word for accepted in the Bible is the same word as having self-dignity or to raise up self Highness or excellency, right? Uh, so there are n these are not imputed definitions, meaning they're not given to him. They are self-defining. I will do these things, right? So the same as when you or I uh, choose to have some self-respect for what we have, what we do, or when we choose to do something good for ourselves, or when we boast. Say, I do good. I am the best. I am the master technician, right? Or I am the master, whatever, right? It's boasting. That actually accepted was a personal accepted. Will you not be accepted for yourself? Will you not be personally boasting yourself? Will you not be, hey, I did right. Not accepted for me, right? So it, it, it's funny because he's questioning him on his intent, his real intent. How many people else can do that? None of us. We don't know the thoughts and intents of others. We pretend to, but we don't. So this accepted is personal implies not only that Cain was intentionally choosing to do something he knew was not good, but he also wanted to demand that his desires, what, become the new standard for God's acceptance. The question from God shows not only his omniscience, 
uh, in his knowledge of Cain's thoughts and intents, but he also, uh, but also it's calling Cain to look at his own thoughts and reasons since he himself knew he was not doing what he was asked to or expected to. Think about this. Adam and Eve were given an example. God sacrificed an animal for them. He made a standard. Abel gave it. There's no contradiction. Why would you give this? And why? The standard was given. They knew they, they were to give a sacrifice. In fact, we know it from all of Leviticus because it defines that later. God is the God that doesn't change. He showed them from the beginning there was a sacrifice necessary. Cain knew what was necessary. He intentionally did the opposite. We don't need God to say, Cain, I told you to give me this offering. You didn't. He made it very clear. His brother made it clear. Adam and Eve made it clear. He made it clear to Adam and Eve in the scripture. <clears throat> so, from the beginning, we have not we have all uh, not only rebelled against God, but like Cain, we've also desired to make our own definitions in every generation. This is also the source of every religion out there, if you think about it. It's the desire of people from the beginning to create their own truth, and thus their own right standing to quench that conscience that God gave every person. See, they're not free from it. Everyone has it. They've all got to deal with it somehow. That's why we create our religions. We create our new definitions to help us redefine it. It's like Hitler when he was killing all the Jews, right, and all the scientists came across. They said, well, they weren't human. They, weren't, they were just uninvolved monkeys. Change a definition all you want doesn't change truth. doesn't change reality. Amen? <clears throat> we as Christians are called by God to be salt and light in the world. Salt not only preserves, but it agitates as, and it cleans. It amplifies things like taste. Light reveals things. It makes things clear. That's a, a pretty big command uh, or, or label to give us to be these things. I mean, a pretty big offense, too. If you think about it, salt is, can be very offensive in, in many different situations. You throw it in somebody's face, it's going to burn the eyes. You uh, pour a mouthful of salt in somebody, on, in somebody. Here, have a spoonful of salt and just give it to them. See how that tastes, right? Or you can flavor food and it can be pleasurable. Right? Same with God's word. The same with us as Christians. We can either accuse somebody and go, you're a lying thief, get away from me. Or we can say, you know, I realize God's going to judge me, and I'm a liar. And we say that before somebody, you know, and that's where God changed my heart, because I realize I have to stand before him one day. What have you done? You've already spoken to them. They, they understand the truth. And they don't have a defense, because you're not attacking them. We have a lot of options. And Jesus gave those examples. Our God is immutable and expects us to speak the truth uh, to the blinded and the willingly blind of this world. We were the same when we grew up. We resisted the truth and challenged the definitions set down by our parents, not just God. Today's generation is no different. However, when there is no one to defend the definitions and to make the truth clear, there will always be a rapid onset of confusion and a blanket allowance for sin. Look at today. When I entered the military, I used to think that the behaviors, descriptions in uh, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah were far too extreme to ever consider a possibility for me to witness in my lifetime in America, right? But in that same time since I entered the military, I've witnessed the removal of the Ten Commandments from the public schools and all places of public authority. And it is amazing from that time till now how rapid all morality in the United States has degraded to such a point that we're accepting. I, I, you're seeing social media things that I would just be like, I, 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 that's almost a description of what, what Sodom and Gomorrah was described as in their sin. Not just what people always say, homosexuality. You see, pride was first. In fact, why did God destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah with not sexual perversion? Read it. He said he destroyed it for their pride. Because pride allows them to violate every sin without conscionable question. I am the God of my own universe. I create my own rules. Thus, I do whatever I please. And everyone has their different sin that pleases them. So, okay. We go back the, to summarize. The first set of definitions we look at <coughs> takes a while to earn, right? One, for example, well, but they change. One, for example, today we stay-at-home parents. Stay-at-home parents are called today lazy or, and is compared to a system of repression and and looked on with disdain. 20 years ago, parents who were raised at home and homeschooled, their children were highly respect. The parents were highly respected as one of the hardest working, most respected workforces America had and were key to making the nation what it was. Uh, you can find tons of articles on that from every major publication. Oh, homeschoolers or parents that raise their children, 
an amazing thing. I mean, they, they're giving their life every day. I mean, teachers only give it for eight hours. You know, I mean, they're, they're balancing all these things and still taking care of their home, right? And today, today, well, you know, you see major articles from CNN and other major publication houses calling homeschool children, homeschooling children uh, child abuse. Or they call uh, home parents are unskilled drains on society. Wow, that's a drastic definition of change, right? How about this, the second definition set given by others. <coughs> <clears throat> these are changed by affect by change consider gender identity today <clears throat> have you ha, tell me this I mean raise your hand if you've heard of these terms non-binary oh, no way okay how about uh, cisgender Whew. how about neurodivergent I mean, these, these are labels that it's not like I'm trying to dig for them these are labels that the people are using on a constant basis on social media today these are their definitions of who they are now instead of male or female. I mean, these are definitions that are given right another, right? <coughs> you know, it wasn't very long ago that, that was, that's all it was. This is humanity and mankind, and literally any word with those three letters in it called man are being rejected. I see, uh, I saw several videos on, I don't want to be called woman, because it has the word man in it. That's, that's repressive. I don't want mankind. I mean, all these things that you're like, what happened? I mean, you're offended at, at three letters because you assume something? So we're, we're leaving these definitions far behind. <coughs> How about this? Think about this. This is, this is a scary one today. <coughs> the definitions of a society uh, that define childhood and adulthood. Uh, there's one that's kind of... Uh, really in question that last last year wasn't even in question but after this uh, school shooting um, politicians and countless people are getting on the media right now and saying well 16 year olds or 13 year olds should be given the right to vote as adults right because they have a they have reasonable sense on how to vote against what or more for more gun control right so they're giving youth they want to give youth 13 or even 16 year, 16 or even 13 year olds the declaration that they're called adults Let's, let's, let's follow that one down the road. If you give a 13-year-old the right of an adult, how many of you think will, they'll be out there next week buying a gun, buying a <laughs> cigarettes, booze, whatever they want? How about this worst thing? This is, this is a, a thing I say uh, not too lightly, and there's no children in the room. Consider <coughs> if 13 becomes the new standard for adulthood, how many people will be released with exonerations and reparations tomorrow um, that were in sexual perversion with children. He's an adult, 13 year old, release me. I mean, that's a jump off a cliff that is so far, it's not even, it, it's not even, it's hardly perceivable. Consider that, that's reality today. That's what we perceive. <clears throat> and that's what we allow. And these are definitions that are constantly changing around us. If we allow this, if we stand by and do nothing, the third definition set can be done only one time. You know, you're now you're not a liar anymore. Now you're just a, uh, you got a habitual problem or you're not a thief, you're a kleptomaniac. You know, it's, it's a medical definition. It's not really your fault, right? So these definitions change. I am running out of time. <coughs> Long-winded, sorry. But here <coughs> is where Christians stand up in every generation to declare the fourth unchanging set of definitions. You see, God gave a set of definitions that doesn't change and that can keep control on those other ones. For brevity's sake, I'll summarize. We are to not only be salt and light, but we are to, in that salt and light, what does light do? It shows the truth, it shows sin, like the Bible says, uh, they that love sin hide in the darkness, and when the light comes, they despise the light because it shows their sin. It defines it, that's the whole point. It defines it. Now we can, again, we can accuse someone of being a liar, or we can just ask them, have you ever lied? We can say, I've lied and I realize I have to stand before God. We have salt and light to be used rightly. It can be used to flavor food or it can be used to shine in a room well to give insight to people or we can use it wickedly. We're no, we're no less guilty of uh, helping men go to hell uh, than anyone else just because we call ourselves Christian and uh, have repented ourselves. You see, we're, we are going, the Bible says, are going to have a great account to give because we have the truth. And we can either use the salt and the light that God gave us 
to please him and honor him. Or we can use it like a bashing rod. And we can ensure that everyone we know will never listen to us again and will never ever have anything to do with Christianity. That's a big accountability to give to God. You see, we're to show love to our enemies and our neighbors and our coworkers. This does not mean we don't stand up and defend the truth. It does not mean we don't have times where we offend people. That's reality. You don't live life on somebody else's definitions. You live life because you live by definitions. You have to or else you die. I mean, they can not like it all they want. People are going to be offended no matter what. It's not my goal to offend people. It's my goal to tell the truth, to be in love. And that's our goal as a Christian. You see, we all define definitions. We all have definitions that define us again as we go and summarize. Uh, so whose definition will you choose to follow? How far will you go? If you follow after God's definitions, will you, you'll be fighting all the time. <coughs> but the value is the eternal souls of those you meet every day. If you choose to follow the world's definitions, what is the value there? To not be offensive or to be offended? And how long will that last when it eventually chokes you because definitions are continually changing based on other people's lusts and desires? <coughs> so you choose what hole you dig. Both of them are going to have vast consequences. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly, Heavenly Lord, uh, I love you, and I ask that, that you help us to not only clarify our own definitions within ourselves, but to stop giving excuses for our sins, to stop giving excuses for our failures, and to humble ourselves, to not only ask forgiveness from you, but even as parents to our children, to when we have wronged them, to ask, our, ask them for forgiveness so they understand how important repentance is, so they understand humility. And to, to tell our friends and our neighbors when we have wronged them, will you forgive me? Humility is the key to starting those things. Truth uh, does not change, Lord, because you are the definer of it. You are the absolute truth. Lord, help us to live after that truth. 